they really take the concept of an escape room, puzzle solving, and then leverage the technology of VR to do things that give you puzzles that you just, like, you, like we said, we couldn't do in real life. I am here with, is it Nazar? Nazar. Nazar. I had a 50-50 chance on the accent and I blew it. Yeah, you know, it's all right. And so, Nazar, you're in the escape room business. Yeah, we have an escape room in Walnut Creek, California. Yep. Uh, Diablo Escapes. We're a mom and pop. And we tried to open the place when COVID started, but that didn't work out. Yeah. And so, did you start out with, like, analog, traditional hardscape escape rooms? Actually, or? this is our first location. Uh, and we were going to open with two live rooms, and um, uh, actually four live rooms initially before we even learned about virtual reality escape rooms. Um, uh, and then uh, COVID hit, so we were in the process of actually getting the space and getting it ready, uh, and we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, so basically, we uh, slowed our investment because we didn't know how long COVID was going to last, uh, and then we were we lived in a county that was really conservative, so. We couldn't open at all, right? For, um, how, for how long? I don't want to relive that. Nobody wants to relive the oh COVID my gosh, nightmare. Yeah. So overall, so long story short then, um, we learned about VR escape rooms about halfway through the year and a half that we were closed before we finally opened in August 2020. I oh, sorry, 2021. And so, and, and so how did that affect your thinking and, and direction then? Yeah, we completely, completely pivoted, changed directions. Uh, we were going to do four live rooms. We decided to do uh, two VR rooms when we learned about VR escape rooms. Um, and partway through that, we were initially going to open with the two live rooms and then do the VR, but we decided we don't know how long COVID's going to last and we, need, and we don't know how much notice we're going to get. You know, we may be told, okay, you can open next week. So we wouldn't be able to kind of hold our investment on the li building out the live rooms and then suddenly be open. But we could do that with VR. So we switched gears, we stopped building out the live rooms, we got ready to do the VR thing, and, uh, and that's what we did. So we got uh, like about a month's notice. So we got up and running really quickly with VR and opened in August 2021, and it's been good since. And so you had, and so, and it, I have so many questions, sorry. We're, we're gonna fast forward and then we're gonna rewind. So did you ever open the, the hardscape rooms? Not yet, we're okay. still working on them. So you still have those rooms, but you're, so you're really running two virtual escape rooms, so. That's right. All right, so, and what's the, how do you view, because one of the things that I've, I've talked to a lot of escape room owners who are in the physical, well, I'll call this physical versus virtual is how I'll kind of characterize them for this conversation. And I've talked to a lot of owners in the physical escape rooms that don't, they see the, 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 they see the theoretical benefits of virtual, so no, you know, you can push a button, you've got a different experience, right? And, and you don't have to have seven rooms all with seven themes. You could have one room with seven themes or however you want to do it. Um, and so what's your, what's your experience so far been with, you know, virtual? And, and, and how is it maybe, is it, has it shifted your thinking around the physical or, and what do the players want to know? Like, what do the players think? I have all these questions, and I can't seem to figure out which one to ask first. So I'll right, let you decide. Right. Um, she is. That's, yeah, that's a lot. Um, I'll start by saying that, um, uh, yeah, well, when we, first, when we first experienced virtual reality escape rooms, we knew we had to do it. Uh, and, and, you know, for all of you who haven't done, if you haven't done escape rooms and you haven't done VR, it's going to be difficult for you to relate, I think. But even, honestly, even if you have done lots of escape rooms, and you have done some like VR roller coaster thing, you probably still don't get it. I, I've taken parents in to watch kids play, uh, and they can see the kids moving around doing stuff. And we show them the game master kind of screen where they can see that they're on a pirate ship, and they're launch, they're firing cannons and you know sword fighting, and you can kind of put it together. But and they, and they wow, they go wow, that's that's amazing that that they can do that. And I say yeah, they're really experiencing being on that ship, but. Unless you've actually done it yourself, you don't quite get it, right? Uh, and that's and that's from my, I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience. I I was skeptical, right? But when I actually got there and did it, I'm like, wow! You can do things in VR that you just cannot do. That's another benefit in in live escape rooms. Yeah, you can't actually build a pirate ship with real cannons in a physical escape room. Yeah, the fire, you know, marshal would have some yeah, issues yeah. with that. You can't have and fire. So you can't have a 50 foot dragon flying over your head shooting fireballs at you either. I yeah. mean. This is true. So one of the first, 
One of the challenges in the early escape room was the, is the games were more kind of action adventure and less puzzly. And the and the hardcore escape room fans um, who exist, they're like it's a thing. Yes. And they'll go to every escape room in a city, right? They'll just that'll be their thing, and there'll be a tour. Um, and, and they didn't feel like the games were puzzled enough. They were they're really fanatical. How are you? What? So how are you? Are you getting that audience? Or are you finding a new audience, a different audience with the VR stu our, uh, escape rooms? And talk yeah. about that. Yeah, I, actually, uh, we have gotten a few people that are avid escape room enthusiasts, um, and uh, we've and we've had them sort of mixed. But I would say like 80% of them love VR escape rooms too. I mean, they don't. Uh, well, and in particular, VR caves escape games have a lot of puzzles in them. I yeah, mean, I think they've done the best job of, yeah. of puzzle puzzleizing the, the games. Yeah. Right, without a doubt, they are they are they really take the concept of an escape room puzzle solving to uh, and then leverage the technology of VR to do things that give you puzzles that you just like you, like we said we couldn't do in real life um, and that are also very clever and very thoughtful. Right, uh, thoughtful puzzles. Um, and so they are challenging, but we, but in addition to those people who love escape rooms, and come to and, and see this as oh, this is really cool. I like it. It's different than a live escape room, but I still love the puzzles and I love the ingenuity behind the the puzzles in VR. Um, they, uh, you know, they they do come back over and over again. Uh, but we also get this audience that has never done VR, and that has never done escape rooms, and they're in for a treat. I mean. You know, hands down, they, they love the experience. Um, it's funny, we've actually had people who have come in, you know, done the waiver, throw their stuff in the lockers, we take them into the empty room, and they kind of have blank looks on their faces. A and I know right away, I've got a group here that thought they signed up for a live escape room. <laughs> and they're looking around going, like, where are all the puzzles? And I usually say, okay, well, imagine there's a puzzle here, okay? And, and they look at me, I I'm not, just kidding. So yeah, I, I explained that it's a VR escape room, and they sometimes they're like, "Oh, really? Wow, that's interesting." And sometimes they're like, "Oh, okay," you know. And I'm like, "Look, you know, you've already paid. <laughs> Let's go ahead and give it a shot." <laughs> uh, and um, and and they often come out saying they don't want to do a live escape room again. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. And, and and I think I wonder about demographically too. So so like, you know, puzzles have a certain what I call a psychographic appeal, right? I mean, you have to like to solve puzzles. I fucking hate puzzles. Like, all right, I am really bad at doing puzzles. I'm terrible at escape rooms. Kylie loves puzzles. She wants to do puzzles all day long. And the nice thing about the VR escape rooms is there's usually some kind of, you know, action element to it. And so while she's solving the puzzle, I'll be able to shoot things. Because I just like to shoot things, right? That's what I want to do. That's fun to me. I don't want to solve puzzles. I want to. The only puzzle I want to solve is how do I reload the gun, right? And so how are you finding that as far as, like, you know, demographic and psychographic appeal of customers, and then how do you communicate that in your community to get them to come and try it? Yeah, so there's a lot in that, too. Let me try and unpack it. So I would say um, what Bob doesn't know is while he's shooting that gun, he's also solving puzzles, right? I mean, that's what VRK has been able to do, is been able to integrate sort of action and, uh, and adventure along with a storyline that makes sense and, is, in, and is, is sort of continuous with the puzzles that you're solving in the game. Um, uh, what was the other question? <laughs> well, just, and then how do you communicate that in the market? Because, you know, what you don't want to do is a, a bait and switch. You don't want people to feel like they're bait and switch. You want a whole bunch of those guys that come into the room and they're like, where's my puzzles? Because then you're dealing with that all day and eventually that's going to hurt your social media ratings, right? And so how do you communicate to the community what this is? Because I think that's one of the biggest challenges with virtual reality is, is how do you communicate it, what it is to people who don't know and haven't tried it? It's, it is, I, I think it's difficult. It's like I said, you don't really get it until you've actually played a game. And then you want to come and play more, right? But um, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of, well, I mean, honestly, I mean, when people just sign up for a regular escape room, they're looking at the website. They, they usually, for the first time, they've never been to that location. They don't, they don't know. I mean, the best thing they, they can do is read reviews. And if you look at our reviews at Diablo Escapes, you'll get a sense for what people are saying about their experience. And they'll talk about, hey, you know, I've never done a VR thing before. I was a little hesitant, but this was great. I had fun with my whole family. Often, you talk about demographics. We, you know, we have three generations sometimes playing, you know, uh, parents, kids, uh, and grandparents, uh, all in the same game. And, and, the, and oftentimes, the grandparents are the ones who bought the tickets. 
because they want to do something fun with the family that the kids will enjoy. And it's a great experience because they're all working together to solve these puzzles and, and even in the action scenes, right? Yeah. Um, and we've had, some, we've had a group of 80-somethings come to play. So, um, and, and we, on the, at the lower end of the age scale, uh, we do 10-year-old birthday parties pretty often. And I would imagine it's hard to get y the younger group in escape rooms. That tends to be more of an adult, not the VR escape rooms, but like more oh. traditional hardscape escape rooms. What's the, what's the age appeal to that, and, and how does it differ maybe? Yeah, I mean, the live escape rooms, you know, honestly, in our area anyway, I, I couldn't speak to everywhere, but um, uh, we actually have uh, an escape room near close to us that's on the Trapeca list. I don't know if you guys know about the Trapeca list. It's like the top 100 escape rooms in the world that was rated by a group of really avid escape room enthusiasts. Um, uh, and um, uh, it, 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 the game is called Ghost Patrol, and it ranked like 23 or 26 on that list. Um, and I talked to those owners there, and they get people wanting to do nine-year-old birthday parties at their escape room location. I think it's a growing thing. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, for us, once we get one birthday party from like one, one kid at a school, we'll suddenly get other birthday parties, you know? And we start asking kids, you know, when, when they're, we do an introduction when they come in to tell them what they're gonna experience, and we ask the kids, hey, so how many of you have been here before? And we are getting more and more hands raised now because as soon as one kid does their birthday party at our location and tells all the other kids about it, right? <laughs> They, the, their parents get wind and they say, "Well, our kid wants to do our escape room at your place." So, and so, and so, you still are you still building out the other two physical rooms? We are. We're doing that slowly. Um, and you know, uh, and for for you guys who've done, done escape rooms before, I've done a lot of them. You know that there's a big range of quality in the live escape room arena, right? Um, uh, one thing about doing VR caves games is the quality is there in every one of their games. They, like I said, they put a lot of thought into it. Um, uh, and in the sort of live escape room arena, you might get escape rooms that puzzle flow isn't really great, the hardware doesn't, the locks don't always work, or you know, something's broken, they forgot to reset a puzzle because customer service isn't great. Um, and then you've got escape rooms like, uh, like Trivium in, in Emeryville, the one I was talking about, and the Trapeca list, they are, they're on it. I mean, they've got really high quality puzzles, really innovative puzzles, um, and so you get a big broad spectrum, especially with like mom and pop escape rooms out there. Um, of quality, um, uh, and so, so you know, read reviews before you go to escape rooms. Is what I said. And say. so, and so, did you have a thought of maybe we shouldn't? So, so, from, so there's a capacity utilization, obviously, that you're measuring with the two, and 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 I'm assuming since you're still building the physical rooms, you haven't quite hit the capacity of the two virtual rooms. But what you're thinking about continuing to invest in the physical rooms after the virtual experience, and I'm not trying to sell VR. I'm actually trying to, no, I'm trying that. to see like, is that is the mix the right thing? And I know you don't know yet because you haven't done it. Yeah. But I want to understand what your thinking is. You know, I, I still believe the mix is the right thing. Um, I do believe that um, people are. So w when they have an experience, a positive experience in an escape room, they want to go back and do another escape room. It you know it's, it's it's sort of a thing that's growing. And I mean. You know, Escape rooms only came to the U.S. in like 2013, so it's still fairly new. Um, the other thing I know also, if, if they start and go to an escape room that's not really great, they don't want to do another one. They think they're all the same, but they're not. They're really not. Um, within a venue, you mean, or within just no, in they'll, general? They'll, in general. They'll, they'll make that generalization. They'll go to one escape room that, you know, we call them smash and grabs. They may, because, you know, escape rooms have become really popular, and so there are these guys that have figured out, hey, we can just invest a little bit of money, get some couches from, you know, Goodwill store or whatever and make this room with paper puzzles, <laughs> paper uh, uh, clues and things like that. And it's not a great escape room. You know, I took, uh, I took my, my 10, well, he's 15 now, but when, I, when he was 10, we took him to a birthday party in San Jose to an escape room that, you know, 10-year-olds, right, group of 10-year-olds, uh, they build it as a one-hour escape room, they finish the escape room in 20 minutes. 20 minutes, wasn't a great escape room. Uh, and then you have these and other... And you don't get, you don't get like 40, 60% of your money back you when don't. you do that. You don't, no. Now you can, you, can, you can sort of, you know, offer your review, <laughs> uh, but you don't get your money back. Um, uh, and so, yeah, those, we call them the smash and grab, you know, escape room companies. But, um, uh, you know, read, like I said, that's why people read reviews before they go. Because what, when you're signing up, if, you, if you've never been to an escape room before and you're looking for one, you're looking at their website and you're making a judgment based on the quality of the website, um, the description of the game, um, but then you really need to read those reviews, right? Yeah. And so what do you charge? So let's talk about money. So um, what do you charge for the virtual escape rooms, and how does that compare to 
other escape rooms in your market? Is it premium? Is it discounted? Is it the same? And then, and then how do people react to that? That's a good question. Now, we, we had a lot of debates, my wife and I, over that. Um, uh, we currently charge uh, $43 per player on weekends and $5 less on weekdays. That's Tuesday through Thursday. We're closed on Mondays. Um, we have uh, a sort of corporate-run escape room. They have m many locations uh, across the US uh, in a neighboring city. Uh, they charge around $40 per, per player. And that's all week, I think. Uh, and there's uh, another one that charges, I think, in, uh, just, uh, just under 40. So we're kind of in the ballpark, a little higher uh, than a standard escape room. But we are lower, if you, by, if you camp like per minute, like half the cost of uh, like Sandbox, which is a more, uh, more of a shoot 'em up Yeah, I just took Sandbox Squid Games in New Jersey. It was $70 for a 25-minute a game, a 30-minute game. So comp to compare apples to apples, in our neighborhood, they have like three locations not too far within like a half an hour drive. Um, and it's, I, th I think it's $55 on the weekend and $50 on the weekday. Yeah, for the Squid Games? Uh, yeah, for, no, well, they're actually, I don't know. Because they're getting a premium for Squid oh, Games. Okay, yeah. maybe they're getting, okay. I think it's just for the regular games. I don't know what the Squid Game cost would be. Um, but there's, I'm, I'm, I haven't played it myself, so take this with a grain of salt. I've heard from our customers that it's about a 30 minute experience. Does that sound right? Um, and um, with our escape games, most of them are 45 minutes of game time, in game time. Uh, but uh, we, some of them we give up to an hour of in-game time. Um, and so, and you know. That would be me because I suck at puzzles. Well, you know, and we give you some tips. Don't worry, Bob. Are the tips automated? How does it work? Like, because I know in a, in a physical escape room, you know, they hit a button or they do something, and then there's an attendant that will give them a clue. How does it work in a virtual escape room? Well, uh, so I would say first, we do have a, a game master as well. So it's, it is attended. Um, uh, the, uh, there is an in-game hint system. This is what we tell customers. There's an in-game hint system. You're welcome to use it. Um, there, the tutorial, once you get the headset on, tells you how to trigger that hint system. And it's a progressive hint system. Uh, it will eventually basically give you the answer to a puzzle, right? Uh, but we can also give them tips. And the game master can hear the, uh, in their headset all the players. The players are talking. Game master can hear everything that's being said. And vice versa, the players hear each other in the headsets as well and can hear the game master when the game master speaks. So if they want a quick tip, uh, the game master can offer a tip verbally. And oftentimes, that's just kind of a nudge to get them kind of headed in the right direction. It's not giving them the answer to a puzzle. How, how important to the consumer experience is the quality of the game master? Like, is it, is it just like somebody hitting the ride button? Or, or are they, like, taking, you know, are, are they assuming the persona of a character in the story? Like, that would be the spectrum, right? Like, a dumb agent over here and a character actor over here. Where do, where do they sit, and, and how do you think about that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so in, in the, the, most of the games, you are, I mean, there's a storyline for sure. So uh, you know, in Dragon Tower, your hapless traveler is traveling through a village. An evil alchemist has to feed someone to the dragon. You know, but there are no more murderers and thieves to feed to the dragon left. So nobody knows you're foreign travelers, right? So they throw you in a tower cell. So there's a storyline behind all that. So you're, you're playing the role of, uh, in that role. There's not, a, there's not an, uh, a character sense in that you don't have a name. But oh, I mean the game master, does the game master then when they're giving them clues or are they like playing a role in that story or oh, is it I fairly generic technical support? Um, nah, for what, that's a good question. For what we do, we're, we're providing support as a game master. Um, we're not, there, there, is, there is a couple, a couple things that we do. We, for example, um, well for 10 year old birthday parties we recommend either laser bots or we put them in um, a situation where they have to fix an anti-meteor laser array to destroy a meteor that's headed towards Earth to save the world. You know, Ten-year-olds, right? Yeah. Uh, and so in that case, I actually do. You know, we 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 we, that we tell them they're you know they're clearing the alien asteroid of robots. But when they're done with that, I, I I you know I get on the headset and I say, okay, hey guys, you guys did really great. You cleared that alien asteroid for us. One, wait, hold on one second. I'm getting a call. Uh, hello. Yes, Mr. President. No, Mr. A meteor? Oh my gosh, Mr. Pre yeah, but we, I just got hit kids here. You can, isn't there another? Oh, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, we'll take care of it, Mr. President. We'll do our best. And then I tell them, hey guys, we had a special, special uh, mission for you. You know, we're gonna have to send you up to an alien. Uh, sorry, to a, a space station. And unfortunately, the the uh, anti meteor laser ray doesn't work. But we'll help you through that. Uh, and you know, they get on the alien. Uh, sorry, sorry, on the, on the space station. Good, that's good. Fix that, and you know, they yeah. have a, a great time destroying that meteor. Yeah, cool. So. Um, 
any thoughts about not building the physical? I'm going to go back to the physical escape room. Do you have any thoughts about like taking one of those and adding another VR or? Well, we don't. It, I would love to add another VR room if I had the space. Yeah, okay. uh, I would. I would have done it already, actually. How big? Um, what's yeah? So space can, space size. I know. And by the way, the VR cave that he's talking about is right behind us, so you should check it out. But how much space does it take versus a physical room? So uh, you should ask them for very specific specifics, right? I think they're about. Uh, I think our smallest room that houses that game is 17 by 20, roughly. Okay. Uh, the play space is a little bit smaller than that. Uh, so we have another between, 350 larger. square feet, for some, somewhere in that range. What's that? 350 square feet or something yeah, about. Yeah, 350 yeah. to 400. Yep. You get a little bit more. Like we have like a 20 by 22 room, which is more than enough. And you can put enough. six players in at a time. Is that the limit? Yeah, Five? sort of. We, no, no, no. We, oh. we do six fairly regularly. Um, we we kind of push those limits. Occasionally, we have a request to do seven, and we've done that before. OK. Uh, we try not to. We'd rather split them up into a group of three and four, because there's just more to do for everybody. Uh, and it's generally a better experience. But they, they say, hey, no, but we want to stay together. Couldn't we please stay together? And I'm like, sure, we can, we can do that. And I think that's a really important point. People want to play together, right? They want social experiences. And there's this, there's this narrative that VR is this isolating technology. And it's not a social experience. But when you put you know, six or seven or five people together in the same room with no cables and headsets, and they can walk around and see you know, each other's avatars and touch each other and bump into each other and collaborate on puzzles together, it is a really social experience. And it's surprising. It, it really is. Uh, and, and, and you know, people do sort of surprising things in, in VR escape rooms, like um, crawling into a trunk. And it looks hilarious when you're a game master watching this person crawl into a virtual trunk and go inside. And that can be, they can actually hide in it, right? And they can pop their head out and say, peekaboo. You know, it's, it's one person did that. It just made me laugh. Anyway, so I had to share that. Um, yeah, uh, people do. Uh, people find interesting ways to solve puzzles that that we didn't. Like it wasn't intended for you to be able to solve that puzzle that way. But yeah, you did it. Good job. Um, but yeah, it definitely is a social sort of thing, uh, without a doubt. I mean, it's it's in some ways. I, I want to say, you know, it's it's just as or more social than even a live escape room because um, you everyone is in your ear. You can hear everyone, um, uh, and sometimes there are lots of screaming. You know, but <laughs> uh, cool. But it's definitely a social experience. Like you said, you stay see each other in VR. Uh, they get two controllers and their their hands in VR, so they can pick things up, throw things, operate a bow and arrow, light a cannon, uh, grab a sword and swashbuckle. I mean, you know, it's it's very very immersive, and you know, in a lot of ways more immersive than even the best escape rooms out there. Um, you know, because everything. Is very detailed. I mean, all the design, everything is very detailed in the in the. Uh, and I think, and I think the longer I'm a big fan of the longer experiences in VR. The longer in VR, the deeper the immersion. The more the fantasy reality line blurs, right? And so, if you're in a five-minute escape uh, experience, you know, you never really forget you're actually in a ride or or doing virtual reality. But if you're in a for, in VR for 25, 35, 45 minutes. You are fully immersed, and you know I've I've leaned on a virtual crate that wasn't there and fallen over 25 minutes into a game before, like, and so it really feels real. And I think that's the beauty of these longer experiences. And I'm, and, I, and escape rooms, you know, are traditionally longer experiences. And I want to see more and more of that as we as we go on. So yeah, cool. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to mention since you brought up longer experiences, um, like I said, those hour-long experiences we talked about cost. They're fifty dollars yeah. that we charge. And okay. And, and do you get price resistance at that? Like, not really. I mean, there. I mean, and we know though, and we we have neighborhoods that you know aren't as well off as some neighborhoods in our area, and um, and we know we can tell you know when the, or when some teens show up and they want to play, uh, that they they, you know, they saved up for this game. Yeah, cool. You know, awesome. Well, good luck with your um, physical escape rooms. Thank you. Hopefully, you get them open this decade. I hope so. <laughs> and, Keep your fingers um, crossed. And uh, yeah, Ch you had a question, Martin? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restate the question just for the recording. So Marty from Ringling College is asking about you know, mixed reality, augmented reality. Are you seeing any of that out there in the world anywhere? And, and, and what do you think I, about I it? I personally have not. I have not really been looking for them either. Um, it's an interesting concept. I think that's something that especially live escape room owners or people who are designing live escape rooms might be thinking about. Um, I think there's some real potential there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, well, Eric. I, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you reached out to, to, to touch the VR code, you were grabbing a roll of headset. And so that so would be... I, I've heard of it. I've not seen it myself. 
And I'm really glad you brought that up because one of the things HTC is working on is this thing called a, they, it's a, they call, we, we call it in the industry the self-tracking tracker. But it's a, it's a tracker that you can put on any object. And then that object will show up in VR no matter where it is. Oh, thank you, and here it is. The first look at the self-tracking tracker. I know they come up with a cute marketing name, but I'm always going to call it the, the self-tracking tracker. And so you can mount this. It has a quarter-inch mount. You can mount this to any object, and that object will show up in VR. And people can pick it up and move it and, and do things with it. And so this is getting easier and easier and easier. It used to be you know, millions of dollars to build those types of experience, and this is going to be like a couple hundred bucks. Can I, can I mention something you didn't ask me about? Yeah. So we've also had people in wheelchairs with one leg, one arm, come and play our games. We do everything we can to accommodate them as well. Um, and it, it really does work. So I mean, yeah. you know, if for any of you are interested in yeah, that, for, the that accessibility topic factor is huge. Yeah, yeah cool. I mean, Thank you. Know, you. Of course, there's some disabilities that we can't accommodate for, but we yeah. do everything we can. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for joining us.